inspiring interviews with today's top landlords. This is the Rental Income Podcast. And now, Dan Lee. The book Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki has basically inspired an entire generation of rental property owners. If you haven't read that book, definitely go check it out. But my guest on the podcast today is lucky enough to have her dad be Rich Dad. He's not the actual guy from the book, but he might as well be. And he really inspired her to get started and helped her get going in the right direction. So today we're going to hear the story of how she bought her first rental property. So let's take a real quick break. We'll come back in 30 seconds and we'll meet Amy Lyon from Portland, Oregon. Are you having a hard time finding great investment properties? Unfortunately, the best deals are rarely found locally. Successful investing begins with the right properties in the right markets. Norada Real Estate provides everything you need to invest in the best deals across the U.S. Our simple, proven system will help you create real wealth and passive monthly cash flow. Get your free copy of the ultimate guide to passive real estate investing at noradarealestate.com slash guide. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com slash guide. Amy, I'm really excited to hear your story. So tell me, your dad was kind of like Rich Dad from Rich Dad, Poor Dad? <laughs> yeah, so... um he was a teacher and he retired and he had a small business for a while, but he worked really hard and he thought, well, maybe it's time that we look at investing in real estate. And the market was such that um, housing was pretty cheap in Sonoma County. And he started accumulating um, with my stepmom properties um, to rent out and it has become really successful for them. Um, they don't own a tremendous amount of properties, but they cash flow pretty well. And he really encouraged me, um, by example and, um, directly by saying, you really need to do this. And so he turned around and he said, I want you to see what it's like. And so they sold one of their properties local to them. They bought one very local to me and they said, we don't want any part of this. You deal with it and see what it's like. And, and we hope you catch the bug and, Yep, I sure did. And a year <laughs> later, we bought our first property. That's awesome. So that that first property was almost a training ground. So you you could learn how to to manage properties and and kind of figure everything out. Was were you, was your dad there to to kind of hold your hand through it, or was it kind of like you had to learn under the pressure and and just kind of figure everything out? Well, I would say that they, he gave me an initial contract that they used in California, but a lot of things were, uh, uh, there were a fair amount of things that were different. But on the flip side, during the escrow process um, for that, that townhouse, we figured, uh, we found a clause in the HOA, the CCNRs, that said that an owner cannot rent out a property unless it's professionally pro it's uh, managed by a licensed property manager. Oh, and wow. I was not a licensed property manager. He was not a licensed property manager. Right. And so this could have kill killed the deal. Instead, I took it as um, maybe showing me the path. And I went and got my property management license in a very short amount of time. And um, that led me to networking with other property managers for continuing education. And I just learned so much about fair housing and Oregon law. And so it gave me a boost of confidence so that I know what is required of a landlord in the state of Oregon. And then each community has some nuances of differences. And I'm able to kind of, through networking, keep up to date on those. I love that you had this roadblock in front of you and you actually turned it around and made it yeah. a positive. Some people maybe would have backed out of that deal, but you said, let's find a way to make this work. Was it well, hard? It really was, like, it really was a very good deal. It was yeah. going to cash flow pretty exceptionally. And the property was only seven years old. It, it, it was just too difficult to pass up, and it seemed yeah. like ultimately a small roadblock. Right, right. Was it hard to get your license? No. Um, for the, it's kind of funny that you can actually get your license through online education, so it was self-paced. And I was a teacher in my career, um, an educator, and so that's no problem. I jumped right in. I blazed through it, probably the slowest process. Um, after getting through the curriculum was getting an appointment for my uh, testing and then waiting for that to go through. Um, they do a background check 
and then getting my actual license to start. Okay. All right. So let's start on, on day one. You, you have this new property. You've closed on it. What do you do next? <laughs> <laughs> well, I I didn't just start right at that moment. I had been gearing up up to that moment. I had been watching the um, rental prices, so I knew what the value was. Um, and it needed a small amount of paint. And while I was taking care of those things, helping my parents, um, I started marketing right away. Um, I did stumble upon my tenant from somebody I knew, and I know that that could be a double-edged sword, but we had an agreement up front that um, we were going to keep it professional in that aspect, and it worked out very well for two years. Um, And not that it ended poorly, it's just that she needed to move on um, because she owned uh, part of another property she was ready to work on okay. and move to. How did you figure out, like, what were you looking at to figure out what the, the perfect rent amount would be? So I start with places like Craigslist because in the Portland area, that is probably the primary place that people look for rentals and finding out what was being put on the market and how quickly it was coming off. And then also the ones that were um, kind of there week after week after week, I could see, well, that's probably not priced appropriately, or maybe there's something in their policies that's a little bit difficult for a tenant to overcome, but just kind of doing some market analysis like that. But really the Portland market is hot. A lot of people, probably a majority of the people rent in the area And so nothing stays on the market for very long. And there are some landlords that charge very large prices, very large security deposits, and they still are able to find tenants. So it is not difficult in the area to find a tenant. Now, tell me about the actual managing. Was that difficult? Like, did you ever feel like this is really stressful or this is really hard or I I don't know what to do? Or did, did it was it really not very difficult once you started doing it? Um, I think I anticipated that it would be very challenging. And I think I've been very fortunate in the tenants that I've picked that they've been very easy to deal with and they've understood um, what I have wanted from them, my expectations. And so we've had pretty good communication. Um, I can be hard-nosed if I have to, and I will always consistently um, implement the policies that I've said I was going to, um, but on the back, you know, on the other side, I'm able to, you know, be forgiving if they have made a mistake. So for instance, I've had two tenants on their first month that after they've paid the security deposit and their initial part of rent, and they've also done their moving expenses and they've changed how they get paid at their work or started a new job or moved from out of state that um, two of those tenants have come up with late rent on the very first full month of rent. Mm. But I have a policy that's um, it, it's a hundred dollar late charge, um, which is more than some other people. Um, the policies in Oregon can either be, you can do a flat fee or you can kind of do a graduated and I just want to be done with it. So a hundred dollars, that's it. And I hope a lesson learned, and that's kind of what's come out of it. They've been very apologetic. They've communicated with me. They've paid the $100 and then not happened again. In my opinion, that is the most important thing you can do as a landlord is have late fees and enforce them. Because if you don't, you're, you're training your tenants to pay you late. You're not putting a consequence there. So right. I- and on the flip side with my newest tenant, I also want to encourage that – If they don't wait out that entire grace period um, for rent, which stresses me out, um, I encourage that they pay early by giving them a discount. They can pay up through midnight the day before the first day the rent is due, and I will give them a $25 discount on their rent. That's good. So just so everyone understands what what you're talking about, typically – that rent is due on the first, but maybe it's not late till the fifth. So that's when your late fee would come in. So you, right. you're saying that if they pay, is it on the first you give them a discount or by the fifth? Well, I have some unique tenants. I accommodate their pay schedule. So my tenants, their rent is due. The first day is fifth. Oh, so fifth. in this okay. case, if she pays on the fourth, 
you know, up through okay. the fourth, she gets a discount. And then the fifth is the first day it's actually due. Okay, perfect. Perfect. All right. Now, I, I want to hear how you scaled things after a, after this first property. This, this seemed like it was a good learning experience. And then you decided that that you felt comfortable with this and you were ready to buy a property uh, on your own. Um, but yeah. first, we need to take a real quick break, get a word in from our sponsor. We will come right back and we will get back to your story. Not an offering of securities. Private investments are highly illiquid and risky and are not suitable for all investors. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Securities offered to accredited investors through North Capital Private Securities. Member FINRA SIPC. If you love the idea of generating passive income with real estate, but maybe you don't have the time to go out there and find deals, vet the deals, and then manage your properties, so maybe you think you can't do it, well, there is a really easy way that you can generate passive income without having to do all the hard work. And that's with Realty Shares, spelled R E A L T Y Shares, RealtyShares.com. What Realty Shares does is they go out there and they find deals, both residential and commercial. They vet the deals, that they make sure they're good investments. And once they feel comfortable with it, they put the deals on their website. And you can log on on your phone or your computer. You can scroll through all the deals. You can read all their due diligence. You can look at the pictures. You can read the bios of the managers. And if something looks good, you can invest as little as $5,000 in a deal. And then all of a sudden, the passive income starts rolling in. So it's really a great way to generate some passive income without having to do all the hard work that it takes to, to buy a rental property. If you want to find out more, if you go to realtyshares.com slash rental, that's R-E-A-L-T-Y shares, realtyshares.com slash rental, you can get some more information. And if you sign up through that link, you'll get $100 towards your first investment. Again, that's realtyshares, spelled R-E-A-L-T-Y shares, realtyshares.com slash rental. All right, let's get back to the interview. Amy, before the break, you were telling us about your first property that your dad owned. How long did it take before you felt comfortable to buy your own rental? So funny enough, it was probably pretty quick after he made that purchase. I I felt confident in the knowledge I had accrued through property management, uh, licensing, and with watching the market that I was personally ready to go. Uh, My husband, not quite there, but getting there. And so I went through continuous market analysis from the spring um, all the way until I, I directly started looking at properties, which was in January, the following year after um, they had purchased the, the townhouse. And I was ready. I felt like I had a, developed with my husband a nice spreadsheet that was able to predict expenses and um, – mortgage costs and and other expenses and be able to see what kind of profit margin we were working with. And Portland is not a market where you can make the 1% of the purchase price every month in rent. So we have much slimmer margins. However, we get more equity because the the housing prices go up. So I felt like in that following January, I was ready to go. And I started looking at properties Um, I had a couple that I thought were really great, but my husband wasn't quite ready. And when we finally did pull the trigger, one property I had looked at for a long time, it actually got sold out from under us. Well, then my husband had caught the bug with me and we started bidding on all sorts of properties, but I was really conservative in what I was willing to spend. So we ended up having to bid on a lot of properties We only won one bid before we purchased. We got the one with the house that we ended up with. And that one ended up in inspection, not having a good foundation and a lot of issues. So we ended up having to back out of that. But by the time that we finally got the house that is ours, it was almost it was over a year past that and that we had been working towards that goal. Okay. So you you looked at houses for for a year, you finally found that that perfect property and and you got it up and, and running. Now, do you um like I guess there there's two different ways that people look at rentals. Either they 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 want to spend as little money as possible and they will just fix things as they come up and then other people 
want to spend money up front and have a property that's totally rehabbed and everything's new and they're not going to have to worry about things. Which camp do you see yourself in? Well, I really love rehabbing properties. So I'm always probably going to lean on doing everything I possibly can up front and really making it um, a high value rental. So it kind of works for me in that there are not a huge amount of properties that are for rent in, in the Portland area that are exceptional looking, um, high end looking. And I'm able to come in and because we do the work ourselves to hands on, get in there, clean out all the garbage, put in some nice touches, not be too excessive. Um, I'm really good about picking materials that are easy to clean for my tenants and easy to maintain and also have longevity. So my goal is to go in, fix it all up as best I can, um, not overspend and then get a, a high value rent and and not have to deal with it for maybe five to 10 years. So d- tell me about the, this first house. Did um, like w- was it did, did it need a ton of updating? <laughs> well, it was built in 1971, and it had two sets of owners. And the second one had bought early enough into the the house's life that they hadn't made any changes. So it was pretty much a 1970s special with green carpet in the dining room, and I mean chartreuse green carpet, <laughs> um, old flooring, yellow countertops in the kitchen. Um, so yeah, I went through and painted cabinets, put new countertops in, took out the, the carpet in the dining room, put some easy care flooring in, updated the appliances. Um, some, some expenses that I kind of anticipated going in, it had popcorn ceiling that did end up being asbestos. So I was able to get the house price lowered for that. And it also had some plumbing issues. So I had the home replumbed. Um, One thing I didn't anticipate was that the furnace had some cracks um, in the internal components, and I didn't want that to be a fire hazard for tenants. So that was my one main unexpected cost. I had to replace the furnace just for my own peace Mm -hmm. of mind. Sure. Um, The actual technician said it was maybe something that needed to be done in the next few years, but it just seemed to me not not to be acceptable to have that be a potential fire flare up. That sounds like a a lot of work. How long did it take to get all that done? (laughs) So um, we closed in October of last year, and we were pretty much done with the work at the beginning of December. Um, I worked pretty much full time on it. But the market in Portland for tenants, um, for people who are willing to move, uh, purchase houses, what whatnot, um, winter is not the time to do it. Now, if you do find a tenant in winter, they are willing to pay top dollar because they're moving for a specific mm-hmm. reason, like relocation or something. But there's not a lot of people who like to move at that time. Um, we did find a tenant by um, the end of January. And that's been working out for us pretty well, but we did have to sit on it for a little bit. Now I have my, um, my leases structured so that they always come up in spring or summer. And so it's not a problem. That's interesting because it it seems like there's maybe less competition over the winter, but there's less houses. And like you said, the people are motivated, they're relocating, they have to find a place. I, I and in the spring there's probably more competition. So I, I wonder, I wonder if if one is better than the other. As yeah, far as- um, we debate that in our um, Portland area rental owners association. Um, we have different camps that that think on it. You can get top dollar if you can find a tenant in winter. And I did have insurance companies reaching out to me um, because they were trying to relocate tenants who had made and their personal home being on fire or flood or some sort of natural disaster kind of situation. And they really did need a rental and they were willing to pay exceptional amounts of money. None of those panned out, but I did have um, regular tenants who were coming to me and their properties were being prepared to be sold because of the market being such that last year we were, um, we had the most growth in the entire country in terms of housing prices. Yeah. 
So now t- tell me, what, what, what has it been difficult? It's been I, I, but six, seven months since you've you've rented this place out. Has it has it been more challenging than the first place, or has it been pretty easy? Um, overall, it was pretty easy. I would say the biggest challenge was having that vacancy for about a month and a half for or two. Um, and I did have to wait for the tenant to be able, you know, to give notice at where they were and, and move over. Although that, that went pretty well because that property was being sold out from under him. Um, he also had the addition of he needed to have, um, the foster care system in Oregon approve of it because he has a foster adult living with him. Okay. And so there was some licensing issues, which I ended up having to work with them a little bit um, in terms of discussing the property, making sure the property was suitable for that, those conditions. Okay. Now tell me this. Now you're managing two properties now. Mm-hmm. Is it difficult or it, it, do, do you feel like before you did this, you, you I, I feel like you thought this might be a lot of work. This is going to be really challenging and difficult. But now that you've got two of them going, is it hard? Or is no, it? No, I'm ready for more. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Now, yeah, I'm, I'm very fortunate in that the people I've rented to have been very good tenants. They've been very easygoing. The problems I've dealt with have been so minor and, um, yeah, overall, it's been an exceptionally positive experience, and and I hope to do more. And so, what what happens if someone calls and they have some kind of a maintenance problem? Are you running over and fixing it, or do you just call a repair person? So far, I'm running over and fixing it. Um, I did have I do have refrigerators in my two units, and I did have one issue with one of the refrigerators that I did end up calling a repair person out for. But otherwise, um, my husband and I are extremely handy. We know how to do a lot of construction as long as what we need to do is within our knowledge base and um, is allowed in the state of Oregon. We've gone ahead and done it ourselves. How about taking payments? Are people using cash, checks, electronic? How do you receive rent? So, yeah, I've I've had one of each. So uh, my very, very first tenant was very big on um, cash is king and bringing me to my house, handing me cash in an envelope every single month, um, which was just kind of a unique experience. And then the next tenant has been very much, they only want to pay by check and they want to bring the check to me as well. And then my most latest one, we really, really pushed for electronic payment and she's on board. And so that has been successful. We've been able to set that up and I think it works out really well. And she's the one that we are giving a discount for if she pays ahead of time. That's perfect. Yeah. Electronic so payments are the best. Pay, yeah. And she can pay right up through midnight. And okay. Get that discount. And I don't have someone knocking at my door at midnight. <laughs> right. Right. Well, so going forward, do, do you want to encourage future tenants to do electronic payments or do you, does it not really matter to you? Um, I, I think I really like the electronic payments. Um, it, like I said, I'm able to set up, like if they pay early, it's so much, if they pay on time, it's so much. And then if I do have to impose that hundred dollar late fee, it's right there, it's automated. Um, and it's kind of a, it becomes that third party. So you're not looking someone in the eye when they're maybe potentially upset about that hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but usually they've pretty much been very accepting it. They know that they have transgressed on the policies and they've, they've just gone, you know, I own it. I'll do it. It's fine. It's the one time never going to happen again. They've been very apologetic, but I like that. Um, it's all the transactions are happening kind of almost behind the scenes. The money's getting to the right accounts and, and everybody's good to go. Now that you've got the the rentals down and you you know how it works, you want to buy more, right? You want to keep growing your portfolio from here? Yeah. So I kind of had two schools of thought. One is that I would like to try and get uh, some sort of multiplex, not large, maybe uh, two to four units. Um, But I also would like to get into house flipping because I really like the aspect of rehabbing homes and um creating equity, and then being able to have that immediate return. I just haven't bridged my education to get from A to B. So A being 
um, buying that, that property potentially on the courthouse steps and then getting to be where I'm more knowledgeable, which is how to rehab a house and get it to the finish line of sa- selling. So I need that that initial knowledge that I'm not quite comfortable with yet. So maybe like somebody that you could partner up with or maybe someone that would mentor you would be helpful? Uh, yes, I, I definitely would be interested in having a mentor help me figure out how to go from buying a note to actually owning and possessing a property. That's the unknown for me, that I don't know all the nuances and I don't want to be caught unaware and and have a a deal kind of go south because I just didn't have that knowledge. Well, if you live in the Portland, Oregon area and you want to maybe link up with Amy and see if, if you guys can partner up or if you could mentor her or something, reach out to me, send me an email at dan at rentalincomepodcast.com and I'll forward it on to Amy and um, we'll, we'll see if we can get you going on your first flip. So, that would uh, be awesome. <laughs> awesome. Well, Amy, thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. You have a great story and congratulations on all you've accomplished. And thank you for listening. We'll be back with the new episode next Tuesday. My name is Dan Lane and this has been the Rental Income Podcast.